Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to present you the paper Trojan Resilience Without Cryptography, written by Shufra Dipshakraborty, Stefan Dzimbowski, Tomasz Lizure, Krzysztof Pietrzak, Michelle Yeo, and me, Małgorzata Gałązka. So hello, and what is this paper about? From the most general perspective, I would say that we investigate the countermeasures against digital Trojans. And existing cryptographic solutions against digital hardware Trojans mostly often use some heavy cryptographic tools. In our case, we focus on extremely simple constructions and still we achieve some meaningful security notion. So the contemporary context of using cryptographic devices looks like that. There exists a user who needs, needs some device realizing functionality F. He may even possess the circle description, but it, she's not a manufacturer by herself. So she simply sends this circuit description to some untrusted factory and receives a circuit, which is hopefully produced according to the specification. Unfortunately, such naivety may be exploited by some bad people I mean, we can easily imagine the opportunities given to the adversary if he can simply produce the cryptographic device. And here you see some headlines from popular newspapers describing successful attacks uh, which were exploiting digital hardware trojans. Some of them probably are still uncovered. So it's a real life problem. And as such, it of course, have some um, has its own place in the world of physical attacks on, crypt on the crypto systems. And now I'll tell you a bit more about this. So where the hardware Trojan horses live? We know that the black box model of cryptographic or even computing device was challenged in the middle of the 90s. Some of us would say that even before, but anyway, in the middle of the 90s, there were published many papers which were describing successful attacks on cryptographic protocols, exploiting the fact that, that the cryptographic device is a physical object. According to the type of the interaction between the adversary and the device, I think we can divide these attacks into three main groups. The first one uh, are leakage attacks, uh, I would say that in this case, the adversary is the most passive. It simply observes and measures the cryptographic device. Sometimes this device is modeled as a logical circuit and then the adversary can simply get to know some values on the wires during the computation. Sometimes it is not modeled this way. Then the leakage is some function, some bounded in the output function on the internal private state and the input and so on. The second type are tampering attacks where the adversary is a bit more active. She can influence the behavior of the, of the circuit. She can modify it. And the third type are hardware trojans. And here the adversary simply produces the cryptographic device. There are some papers which investigate this problem in a very systematic way. Just to mention, for the leakage, there is a paper private circuit, for the tampering private circuits too, and for the Trojans, there are also some papers, and yes, there is a paper private circuit too. So as this problem is very practical, very common, of course, exist different solutions. And the first group of the solutions are physical countermeasures. This approach consists of many different methods such as physical scanning, optical inspection, electromagnetic analysis, input-output analysis, and many other. Unfortunately, they are quite costly. I mean, we need to check every single circuit. And secondly, even if the circuit passes all the tests, we are not sure if we uncover the malicious behavior of the circuit. There's another group of solutions. I call them cryptographic countermeasures since they make use of some cryptographic tools to make the circuit more secure. They work as follows. There is a user who has in mind some functionality F, puts this F into a kind of compiler, and this compiler outputs a description 
of the device which would realize the functionality F and be secure. And as we can see, this um, device consists of two main parts. The one in the center is a trusted part and the other ones are untrusted ones. And there can be only one untrusted or many of them, it depends. Then the user sends a specification to two manufacturers, the honest one, which produces the honest, honest component and to untrusted one, which produces potentially malicious circuits. After re receiving both components, the user make a device from both of them in a trusted manner and then can use it. Sometimes the testing phase is added by the testing phase, I mean the input output testing, I will tell you more about it later. And what's important here that we really need this, this trusted component, we can ask ourselves if it makes any sense to make such a complicated procedure if the user has access to the trusted manufacturer? And the answer is, of course, it depends. Obviously, the size of the trusted module must be much smaller than the size of the circuit, which would simply realize the functionality F. Sometimes the user and the trusted manufacturer are the same entity. We can imagine if the trusted component is very simple, we can make it simple at home. Okay, so now, now I will present you the existing cryptographic solution against hardware trojans. I think this solution is quite natural. The device which would realize the functionality F consists of two parts, two components. The trusted one is a verifier and the untrusted one is a prover. I would call it verifiable computation approach. And it works as follows. The user sends input X to the verifier. The verifier sends it to the prover. The prover computes F from X and a proof, sends the result and the proof to the verifier. The verifier verifies. And if the verification was done correctly, then it sends Y to the user. Otherwise, it sends that there is no error. From now, we will live only in the world of digital hardware Trojans. And the digital hardware Trojans is a subclass of hardware Trojans with some restrictions. So first of them is that the digital hardware Trojan have no auxiliary input output channels. And the second restriction is that they have no physical clocks, antennas, sensors, etc. Just to give you the flavor of it, we say that digital hardware trojans, they behave maliciously only internally, by which I mean we can treat them as a black boxes which have no communication with the environment other than uh, the provided one by the specification. And here I would like to emphasize that even if the specification is stateless, the digital hardware trojans can be stateful. So there exists some research on the topic of stateless trojans. Now I have in mind the countermeasures against algorithm substitution attacks, but they are not very interesting for us. Since the communication of the digital hardware trojans is honest, the input output testing countermeasure seems very promising. So now I'll tell you more about the testing. Okay, so if the device is tested before releasing it, we can say that the cycle of its life has two phases. And the first is the lock phase. And in the lock phase, here this blue one is the device, and here is the trusted implementation of functionality F. And the input X is given to both of them. And then we check the equality if the device and the trusted functionality outputs the same value. It is done for some number of times. Mostly often, we bound the length of the lab phase by 
some constant. And then there is the wired phase where the device is released and used. And it is very simple then. It just receives some input X and outputs some Y. So I'd call this simple testing. We can take a look how we can adapt such a protocol. So first of all, in the wire, the adversary can influence the given inputs and the device can deviate whenever it gets some very rare subset of the inputs. Then it will be not revealed in the lock phase, but in the white phase, the device can start deviating. We call such type of attacks cheat codes. And the second type take advantage from the fact that the number of tests is bounded. Here is this um, red time where the adversary can deviate and will not be caught for sure. And we call such type of attacks time bonds. Okay, so now we have some intuition. What can go wrong? when we test. Mm, and we can have a look at some other paper, which is the promised private surface three and how it works against them. So in this paper, the following construction was proposed. Mm, the devices are tested in the lab phase independently for some random number of times. And then in the wire, the following construction will work. The untrusted parts, are arranged in the triples. The master in every step receives some input X. This input is secretly shared to, to the triples. They follow the protocol, compute the value F from X. And then the master circuit compute the majority of the outputs and output the majority. During the wired phase, some of the triples may start deviating but the probability that more than half of the triples start deviating during the white phase is negligible. So the master always output the right value. Here, I think this picture is a bit misleading since uh, the lab phase must be much longer than the white phase. But now we can see how it works against these two types of attacks, which I mentioned before, I mean, I mean cheat codes. So against cheat codes works the secret sharing, um, even if the adversary can influence the inputs in the wild, from the perspective of a single circuit, it receives just random values. And this, this synchronization, by this I mean that the lab phase can be very long and very short comparing to the white phase. And that the length of the lab phase differs for every single circuit. We have the countermeasure against the time bombs. So now we can move to our construction, to our research. We were investigating the very simple constructions. And now I, can, I will tell you more about the circuits in these constructions. So first of all, the master in simple constructions are very, very simple. By this, I mean that they can contain only a few equality, multiplexer and repetition gates. And secondly, there are no changes in the specification of uh, the untrusted circuits. By this, I mean that if we have some circuit which would realize the functionality F, then we can simply use it in our construction. And this has two big advantages. First of all, we have no overhead in size cost of time. And secondly, we can simply reduce already produced circuits. So I think that this without cryptography part in the title of our paper comes from this, yes, we have no heavy crypto here. How does the security game looks like for the simple constructions? Again, we have the lab phase, which lasts for some time, where by time of, I of course mean the number of tests and the total number of tests performed or on 
all of the devices is bounded by ISO number T. And then we go to the wild. And in the wild, the following construction will, will work. The master is joined with every circuit separately. It receives some inputs and auxiliary randomness and then outputs a value. And what are the goals of the adversary in this game? So first of all, in, she needs to survive the lab phase. As you remember in the lab phase, we're checking the outputs of the circuits with the trusted implementation. So surviving the lab phase means that no misbehaving is detected in the lab phase. Secondly, the adversary wants to survive the wild phase. What does it mean? As you remember, the master circuit may contain the quality gates. So if it receives some inputs and gives one input to two different circuits and would receive two different outputs, then the game stops immediately and the adversary just loses. Okay, up to now it's very easy. I mean, the adversary can simply produce the honest circuits. We have this third goal, which is make the master to output many wrong outputs. So what is the main problem with simple constructions when we already know the circuits and the game, the security game? So first of all, it's vulnerable to cheat codes. I mean, we had no countermeasure against, this, against the cheat codes here because the master receives simply the inputs and with a few gates, it cannot do anything with them. So to get rid of it, we assume also that the inputs in the wild phase are IID. So now we, can, we are ready to give a bit more formal definition of the security game. So the Trojan game has three parameters. The first one is the uh, construction P. The second one is the bound T on the length of the lab phase. And the third one is the length of the white phase Q. And the game has three following steps. The first step is that the adversary chooses the functionality F and the Trojan circuits. The second step is the lab phase is performed. Um, the lab phase is performed on IID inputs and the outputs are verified by the trusted implementation. And the length of the lab phase is a random variable a uniform random variable from zero to T. And the third step is the wild phase, which is performed on IID inputs as well, which is verified only by the cross checks. I mean, the equality gate by the master. Okay, and again, the goal of the game is not being caught in the lab and the wild phases and to make master output many wrong outputs and the adversary has to achieve both of these goals simultaneously. So if there is any error during the lab phase or the white phase, the game immediately stops. Now I, I can tell you something about the limitations of simple constructions, because there exists some. Consider the following adversarial strategy. Let's say that she produces the circuits which deviate on the one over t fraction of the inputs. And what's important, all of them deviate on the same inputs. And for such a strategy, the adversary survives the lab phase with probability one over E. It's very easy math here. And, and she survives the white phase with probability equal to one. Why? Because all of the circuit always answer in the same way for the same input and the master can only check the quality of the outputs. And moreover, the, the master produces one over T fraction of wrong outputs in the wild. To go to our result, we need two more definitions. So the first one is winning the game. And we say that an adversary win wrong wins in Trojan game 
if the master outputs more than a wrong fraction of wrong values without the Trojans being detected with probability greater than win. Okay, so this is the win game. And the security definition, we say that P is win wrong Trojan resilient if for sufficiently large Q and Q, no adversary win from T, wrong from T wins in the Trojan game P, T, Q. Okay, maybe we need some time to parse it. Now I have some good news and bad news for you, for us, actually. So as always, bad news first. So for any C greater than zero, there exists a constant C prime greater than zero, such that no simple scheme P is C comma C prime over T Trojan resilient. It comes from the previous strategy, we, which was presented two slides ago. And the good news are that nothing worse can happen. And what does it mean? I'll tell you in a few minutes, just to give you the intuition why our construction, which consists of 12 potentially malicious circuits works. We will go through some a bit simpler constructions. So the first one is the construction for stateless Trojans. Here, the number of tests is a random variable uniform random variable bounded by t. There's no need to have any trusted model here. And this construction meets the optimal security parameters. Okay, I was presenting it before when I was talking about the testing and there were two problems. The first one was the cheat codes and there are no cheat codes since the inputs in the wild are IID and time bombs, and we have no time bombs since the Trojan is stateless and it cannot remember how many times it was used. Yes, and as, as I said, adding the counter make it fail. The second construction works for history independent Trojans, in other words, the counter Trojans, by which I mean they have the internal states only indicates how many times it was used in, the, uh, in total. So circuits have counters, only one circuit is tested as before for some uniform random number of times. And in the wild, they're cross-checked in every single step. So in the lab phase, this circuit was cross-checked with trusted implementation and in the wild, they're cross-checked with themselves. And this cross instruction meets the optimal security parameter as well. It's not very interesting by itself, but we use it in our proof for reduction. I'll show you later where, maybe not how exactly, but where. And the proof that this is secure is not trivial. So I'd like to emphasize that this construction is not secure against general stateful digital hardware Trojans. The circuits are cross-checked in the wild in every single step. So the following strategy would work very well. I mean, deviate it once, deviate for always. Why? Because from the perspective of F1, for instance, if I deviate it, there are two possibilities. The first one, I was cross-checked with F2, which also misbehaved. And then F2 has the same strategy, so we can deviate for, from now. And the second possibility is that I was cross-checked with F2, which did not deviate. And then game is over anyway. And now I can show you the construction which we believe is secure against stateful digital Trojans. And it's very similar to the previous one. The only difference in, is in the wild in the cross checks. The circuits F1 F, and F2 are cross checked only with quite small probability. And in other cases, only one of them receives the input. And then if F1 deviated, there are three possibilities. 
the product two, which I mentioned before, and the third one that it deviated, but wasn't cross-checked with F2 and the game is still not over. So yeah, I just as said, omitting circuits allows this, the synchronization. Okay, so now I'll tell you about four circuit construction, which is a building block for our 12 circuit construction. And it works as follows. Only circuits one and three are tested. The master in the wipe gets two inputs and the random bit B. And according to the value of the bit B, the inputs are distributed. And after the distribution and receiving the outputs, the master performs the cross checks. If the cross checks are correct, the master outputs the output of the first circuit. It's here. If they are not, the game stops. So here's the example how it works. Uh, how are the cross checks in the case of bit B equal to zero? And how it works if bit B is equal to one? Um, okay, so I think we are ready to present our technical result and the construction, which means it. So for any constant C greater than zero, there exists a constant C prime such that the simple construction P12, which will be presented in the next slide, is C comma C prime over T Trojan resilient. And this is how the construction looks like. So this picture was on the previous slide. Yeah, the construction consists of three, four circuit sub modules. And the master in every step receives three inputs and distributes them according to the value of the bit B, just as written here. What's important, all of three outputs can be used. As I told you, for history independent Trojans, we need only two circuits to make a construction which is secure. And I told you that it's not very interesting, but we use it in our proof. So here, this yellow part of the picture shows, so here, this yellow part shows the part which is reduced to the security of, of the circuit constructions for history independent Trojans. Okay, so one more sentence, why we do all of this stuff. Um, so as I told you when was, I was describing our conjecture about the two circuit construction secure against general stateful digital hardware trojans, I told you something like, if the two circuits share the same history, they can benefit from mm, deviated ones, deviated for always strategy. And in this conjecture, they don't share the same history and they cannot benefit it from anymore. And here is a similar situation that F1 is cross-checked with F2 and F3, but they do not share the same history of SIM inputs. These histories are dependent, but not the same. So this is the general reason why it works. I really encourage you to read the paper because I think this proof is very nice. But of course, you can ask yourself why. I mean, this security notion, which I mentioned, is not great. By this, I mean that it is meaningful, but at the same time, it doesn't fit to every application. So what are the possible applications of our constructions? And um, I'd like to say that only that uh, there are two main restrictions. The first one is there is a non-negligible fraction of wrong outputs with non-negligible probability. And this is the important one. So we, we have to tolerate some fraction of wrong outputs as long as there are not very many of them. Just to remind you, there was one over t fraction of wrong outputs with constant probability. Okay, so for instance, for PRDs, we are actually not very interested in the outputs to be correct, but to be indistinguishable from random. So this is a possible direction of the further research. 
And the second restriction is that the inputs must be RIB. It can be relaxed, but still they cannot be controlled by the adversary. So we currently work on the stream ciphers and we use uh, this construction as a building block. So just to compare our um, paper with the existing um, solutions, um, here are these uh, three methods which I mentioned in my presentation. The first one is the MPC from Private Circus 3, the second one, verifiable computation from verifiable ASIC, and yeah, and this paper. In MPC solution, uh, the lab phase is much longer than the wild phase, and the specification is very complicated. For the verifiable computation, we have no liveness guarantee, and the master circuit is very expensive. And in our paper, we have no weakness, liveness guarantee and have weaker security parameters. But what are the advantages of this construction? Uh, the advantage of the MPC is, of course, liveness guarantee. For verifiable computation, the, white phase, the length of the white phase is unbounded. And the outputs are always correct when provided, oh, of course, almost. And in this paper, we have also unbounded white phase. The master circuit is very cheap. And what's important also that we have a block box access to the functionality. And we'd be very happy to answer any of your questions. Probably I won't be on this same person. I'll be available online on the session. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye.